All right, hello everybody, welcome to another electronics video. Um, I know I haven't posted one in a while, so I'll try to be better about that in the future. Uh, but this video is going to cover power components. All right? I know in the last video we talked about batteries. This video is all about the components that allow us to distribute the battery power to all our controllers on our FRC robots. Okay, So we can't really talk about these components without first talking about fuses. Right? So fuses protect circuits from drawing too much current, right? So a lot of times, or hopefully not, right? But sometimes you'll have some shorts or some electrical faults in your circuits, right? And you know, be sure you protect uh, those, those sensitive circuits from drawing too much current accidentally and causing um, irreversible damage, right? And this, that's what fuses do, right? I think of fuses as kind of like the last line of defense uh, for, um, for protecting against overcurrent. Right? And the way fuses work is they have this little inner metal strip that burns away when you drop too much current. And when this metal strip burns away, you open the circuit, right? And with the open circuit, you have no current flow. All right. um, and when you blow a fuse, you know you've messed up big time, right? Um, and so if you ever blow a fuse, you need to kind of step back, reevaluate your circuits, reevaluate all your connections, and make sure you're not doing anything wrong. Right? Um, only then should you like turn on the robot and try again. Right? Blowing fuses are a big deal and you'll try to avoid it as much as possible, all right? And blowing fuses are actually pretty hard, right? So I have this 40 amp fuse right here, um, and say I go to 41 amps, it's not that the fuse immediately kills itself, right? That's not, that's not how these fuses work. Um, there's kind of two ways uh, I think of that you can blow these fuses. The first way is if you draw an extremely hard current, right? So I have this 40 amp fuse. If I draw a current way, way beyond that, right, for even a brief instant, right, uh, for a brief moment, these fuses can blow. Right? The other way is if I draw above the threshold current for an extended period of time. Right? For a, like when I mean extended, I mean extended period of time. Right? Um, and so when we get into software videos, right, you'll see that oftentimes we allow motors to draw up to 60 amps. But you wonder, like, that doesn't make any sense because the fuses we put on the terminals are 40 amps. So how does that work? Right? Well, because these fuses only blow if you provide a high current for an extended period of time. Drawing 60 amps for a little bit is perfectly fine and nothing happen will happen to the fuse. All right, something I also want to note is um, this one right here is our yellow 20 amp fuse. And for these fuses, you can actually tell if they're blown by just, just by looking at this kind of U-shaped wire right here. If you see that it's, um, it's broken or black, you know you've blown the fuse. Okay, so now we know about fuses. Let's get on to our power distribution panel, our PDP. All right, so this guy is responsible for regulating and distributing battery power to all FRC components. Okay, and so just to give you a little bit of the anatomy of this controller, right? So these red and black kind of terminals right here are called the Wago connectors, right? And this is where we have we usually use or plug in our motor controllers. Right, so all motor controllers plug in to our Wago connectors. These big ones right here are rated for are, are for our 40 amp fuses. Right? So our 40 amp fuses plug into these little slots here. Um, and we reserve these 40 amp slots for our high power motors. Right? These high power motors are things like our drive crane. This year was our shooter, our climb. Things that are going to demand a lot of current, we, uh, we, we reserve for our 40 amp slots. Right? These smaller ones right here are our 30 or 20 amp fuse slots. Right? And we reserve these for things like the intake motor or hopper, things that are not, that are not going to draw as much current. Okay. Um, and this is also a CAN device, right? So the PDP provides information to our Roborio and our software about uh, how much current is being drawn by any any of the terminals, right? So any anyone from 0 to 15 provides data about that and the, the amount of voltage being supplied, right? It does that by communicating over the CAN bus, right? And this is normally where the CAN bus terminates. So we'll have a video more in depth about the CAN bus in the future, but just know that this is usually where the CAN bus terminates. Okay. Um, and it's I, I highlighted these especially because they're kind of hard to see, but these these white terminals they're called wide Muller connectors. That's at least how I pronounce them, right? And the, and the two uh, and the terminal right here is for our Roborio power and it's connected to this 10 amp fuse right here. Okay, the other the, the other two are, are dedicated to our VRM and PCM, our voltage regulator module, which we'll cover in a few slides. 
and our PCM, our pneumatic control module, which we'll cover in a future video, right? And these guys are connected to our 20 amp fuse right here. And we also have our CAN termination toggle, our post CAN termination. We'll talk about post CAN termination in a future video, but know that we can toggle between terminating the CAN bus at the PDP and not terminating the CAN bus at the PDB by by moving this tiny jumper um, in this area right here. Now this, oh, you'll be, you'll be able to see this much better once you have an actual PDP in your hand, but just know toggling happens at that point. Okay, that's our PDP. Um, I'm gonna get into a little bit more, more about the specific connections, right? The first one is a battery harness. And in my opinion, the battery, the connection between the battery and the PDP or the breaker and the PDP is the most important connection of the entire robot, right? Because this is the point where all electricity comes into the robot. If this point fails, your entire robot is dead, right? And so one, so this is very pre pretty self-explanatory, right? You just uh, use the compression lugs, use the hole and compression lugs and kind of use the F6 screw to screw it as tightly as you can into the slots right here. And then you put a little case that goes on top of it just to make sure you don't have any shorts. Um, but one thing in particular that's often overlooked is this little washer right here. This washer is very important and don't lose it, right? Um, this washer and make sure that you have a secure connection and you don't have any brownout or power issues, right? So be sure you put that washer in because it is essential. Right? So as our battery harness, next is the Wago connectors, right? So these guys, again, FRC makes it pretty simple, simple for us in wiring these. That's all you gotta do is take a flathead and put it in that slot right here. And if you kind of wrench it down, so wrench it down like that, on the inside clamp, there's a clamp that holds the wire down, the clamp will open up. You push a uh, wire in uh, with about one centimeter of insulation stripped into the into the connector and release the flathead and it will be secure, right? So once you do that, be sure, give it a tug, make sure there's no strands of wire kind of coming out and possibly causing a short. Um, just until inspect it, make sure it's all good before you move on to the next connection, right? And again, oftentimes I see people, um, when I like give them, give them wiring the PDB for the first time, they often strip too much uh, insulation when they stick it in. Uh, you don't need to strip very much, just a centimeter is good enough, right? Um, because all you need to do is make sure the metal at the tip of your wire is, connect, is, connect, is, sorry, is touching the inner conductor of the terminal. All right, so that's a Wago connector. And the last one is Wild Miller connectors. Um, I have a little bit more information about this one because this, in my opinion, is the connector that fails the most often. And in my opinion, again, is the most painful connector of FRC, right? The Wild Miller connectors. They, they're the ones with the white tabs, right? So these Wild Miller connectors, they are meant for any wire between 16 to 24 gauge. Uh, we use 18 gauge, which is kind of right in the sweet spot. Um, so here's some procedure for how you wire a Wild Miller uh, connector terminal. All right, so first you're going to shove about three eighths of an inch of insulation off the end of the wire, right? Um, then you're going to kind of twist the twist the strands to make sure you don't you don't the wires don't fray when you put it inside inside the wide miller connector. Um, and then while you're pressing the white tab down, you can use a screwdriver. You can use your finger, right? While you're pressing it down, you're going to carefully, very very carefully insert the wire into the hole, right? and you're going to do it as far as you can. Um, and then once you think you've reached the end, right, you're going to let go of the white tab and kind of give it a tug test, make sure it's secure. And you're going to inspect for any exposed wire, right? We don't want any strands that are kind of wandering around because number one, that can cause a short. And number two, and this is more, more of a minor reason, it kind of increases the resistivity right at that point, right? And you can probably tell, like, if you watch our video on resistance, you probably know that's not really a big deal. But just know we're trying to prevent shorts, and so let's keep all our exposed wire in all our wire inside the terminal okay and just talking about the exposed wire and um, fraying right there are things called ferrules that are meant to help with this right i have over the years i've collected a bunch of ferrules that have ended up in my pockets after robotics meetings um but this is an example of one i found lying around things got hard. i don't have very good lighting but they kind of look like this right um and this one in particular only has a wire inside it um, but that's kind of what it looks like. Um, and they, they're meant to prevent fraying. They they give us pay, a, a slot where you can insert all your wire and kind of crimp the end with this orange crimping tool we have at Robotics, right? 
and it keeps all the strands in place and make it, makes it really easy to place in our wild middle connectors. So our advantage of these is there's no fraying and easier intuition, easier managing, management of electronics. But there are some disadvantages, right? The disadvantages is that it's more steps because when I do electronics, I have to also keep in mind of applying this crimp onto it, right? And it's another failure point. And so if you if you look at our electronics boards um, before 2019 or 2019 and before that, right, we were using ferrules all over the place. They were the most beautiful thing to me, right? Um, and look because it makes it easy, right? No, no, you don't have to worry about fraying. You don't have to worry about any of that. But um, I think 2019 at our Glacier Peak competition, these ferrules were probably responsible for us losing about two matches because it's just another failure point, right? The wire can easily come, sometimes come out of the ferrule and the, con the circuit becomes open and you have no current flow anymore, right? So these things are kind of like a double-edged sword. Um, and so in 2020, we kind of stepped away from using the ferrules and so far our experience from our one competition at Glacier Peak, it was a great idea and we haven't had any electrical failures, All right? So just know that at robotics, we don't use ferrules anymore. All right, so do not. Uh, do not, for to make our PDP happy, right? And you don't want to make it, their PDP cry. Right? You do not want to insert trade wires. Check all, check to make sure all your wires are going where you want them to go. Uh, do not directly power motors from the PDP. It may be easier, right? Then just then have to, having to go through a motor controller and writing code, right? But the PDP is not designed for managing things like inductive discharge, right? That we talked about in motor, DC motor part two, right? There's a lot of nuance with when you drive a motor and the PDP is not meant, is not designed to handle those nuances. I do not switch black and red wires, right? Uh, the PDP, although the PDP has a risk polarity protection, uh, some of the internal sensory, current sensory circuits do not, right? And you can cause permanent damage to the sensory circuits inside the PDP if you have, a, if you reverse the polarity of your wires. And also a lot of contours that connect to the PDP do not have reverse polarity protection. So you risk damaging those permanently also if you switch the wires. Do not short out fuses, right? This is often shortcut used. Um, I haven't seen it much in FRC, but outside of FRC, this is a frequent shortcut used. Actually, I'm, I've done this before at a outreach event. Uh, that was kind of like our uh, last ditch effort of keeping the robot running. But do not do this because again, as you see, fuses are very important as a last line of defense and can cause some serious and expensive damage to your robot. And again, this is for this is this is just a reminder for idiots like me who handle live battery current. Don't do it. Right? I've I've got burns on burns on my hands from uh, from being an idiot and handling live battery current. The thing won't kill you, but it will cause serious damage to your skin. So don't do it. And what you should do, you should tug test all your wires and make sure no strands are visible. You should securely test the battery wires because remember that's the most important connection of the robot. Uh, you should check infuses before inserting. You should use a multimeter, check the resistivity through the freezes to make sure it's not blown before you put it in your robot. Um, and, and ensure all fuses are properly seated, right? A f you know a fuse is properly inserted into the PDP if you cannot use your fingers and take it out, right? The only way you should be able to take out a fuse is by using a plier. That's kind of like a rule of thumb. All right, so onto our voltage regulator module. So we covered a PDP and onto our voltage regulator module. All right, so voltage regulator module provides constant and stable voltage for our robot radio and other applications, all right? Our robot radio kind of plugs into this 12 volt, two amp slots here. And we take two, it takes two slots because we provide redundant power. I'll get into more detail about this in a future video, but just know that the 12 volt, two amp slots are completely occupied for our robot, uh, robot radio. Some other kind of terminals, the 12 volt input comes from our PDP, of course, right? The 20 amp uh, fuse on our PDP. We have our 5 volt 2 amp, 5 volt 500 milliamp, and 12 volt 500 milliamp. And these two LEDs kind of show you the two status for the 5 volt side and the 12 volt side. All right. That's a voltage regulated module anatomy, right? And this is not a CAN device. So this, you don't get any telemetry or any data back from the voltage regulated module, unlike the PDP. All right. VRMs are absolutely beautiful and they're absolutely crazy, right? It's amazing how beautiful they are and how crazy they are and like in how we, how they work. And right? this is a chart I got directly off of the VRM docs, right? 
Um, the x-axis is the voltage being provided by the battery, and the y-axis is the voltage being supplied by the VRM. And you can see right, the voltage being supplied by the battery is 14 volts, yet it regulates it down to 12 volts, right? And this goes all the way down to four and a half volts, right? And it's still providing 12 volts of power. It's converting four and a half volts into 12 volts. This is just absolutely mind blowing, right? They're absolutely crazy. And the way that works is through using something called a SEPIC buck boost converter. If you were here in 2019, FRC 2019, you're familiar with buck boost converters. This is what we use to power our secondary vision system, which are Jetson. Uh, but they're just slightly different. SEPIC, I think, stands for um, Single Ended Primary Inductive Controller, I think. You probably want to double check that online. Um, but they are able to take an input voltage that's below or above the target voltage and use uh, capacitors and inductors and some clever switching to bring that, that variable voltage up to their uh, to that target voltage, right? So uh, th this is kind of an inner diagram of the VRM, right? And so if you have the voltage input, it goes through a 12 volt SEPIC converter, and say we're going for 12 volt two amps or Raybar radio power, goes through this two amps uh, current limiter, and eventually it reaches our radio. And so this is kind of the inner anatomy, the inner workings of a VRM. A VRM works off a SEPIC converter and a current limiter PTC. Alrighty, so I don't have any example questions for this one. I think that everything is pretty self-explanatory. But just remember, if you treat your controller as well, they'll treat you well at competition, right? It's a mutual relationship. Um, and that's about it for this video. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'll be happy to answer them. I know like things like accepting converters can be pretty complicated. Uh, and if you want me to go into more detail about those, let me know. So that's it for this one. Um, I'll see you later.